First of all, I think it's best that you forget current events for the next hour, or you will drown in irony, um, sad to say. This is a drama, a duel, we might say, between two extremely influential men, Shostakovich. In order to get a clear picture of what went on, I'm going to have to skip around the timeline. It's not going to be he was born, he had kids, he died. It's going to skip around the timeline. He was a survivor. He was a hypocrite. He survived. Many did not. He said what was expected of the Soviet Communist Party. He believed very differently. He was the symbol of Soviet culture and extremely vulnerable because of that. Whereas Joseph, well, we'll come to that. He didn't like the name Druzha Stavili. He took on a new name, Stalin. In Russian, it means Iron Man, Stalin. He was a symbol of ruthless torture with no regard to life. He protected his rule by slaughtering those that he feared or imagined threatened him. The numbers are staggering. He's a promoter of Russian culture in the extreme to the hateful exclusion and brutal fury towards all others, especially Western music and the arts. If you miss that, you miss it all. Shostakovich, on the other hand, was a Soviet symbol of Russian culture. He was their Elgin John, their Madonna, their Michael Jackson, their Statue of Liberty. He was loved and respected by everyone, and therein lies the problem. Let's go back in time just a little bit. In 1700, Peter the Great, secured a little snitch from Finland, and he called it Petrograd, or St. Petersburg. It was a way to get easy access to the Atlantic Ocean. It became the cultural city of Russia. Much of creativity stemmed from there, and by the way, it was heavily Jewish. Leningrad was Russia's connection with Paris, London, Berlin, Madrid, and the Atlantic through the Bay of Finland. It was once the capital of Russia. In many ways, it was on a par with the culture of Europe. Concert Hall's palace and fabulous hotels like the Astoria Hotel. We'll come back to that. Around the 1930s, it was mired all over the world. And by the way, it was the only way, is the only way, that Russia could get to the Atlantic without going through a winding river to the Black Sea, then a narrow waterway through Istanbul, then a small lake through Turkey, then you wind up at the uh, Greek Isles, you go through the narrows at the tip of Italy, then the Straits of uh, West Spain, it's, in wartime, it's a suicide path. But through Leningrad, you're in the Atlantic. It works today. Strategically, Leningrad is very important. And in the 1930s, Hitler decided, I want that. His eyes turned to Leningrad, and he planned to take it. After uh, shaking hands with Stalin, hugs, love letters, maybe a smooch, he and Stalin decided they would split Europe down the middle, but that's not what Hitler really had in mind. He wanted Leningrad. His plan was to surround Leningrad with Nazi troops in trenches and not allow anything in or out 
and starve the population to death. In 1941, Hitler announced to everybody that on Sunday, August 9th in the evening, the Nazis would march in and eliminate the few that were surviving. August 9th in the evening. You know what that this is. That was 81 years ago to the hour of now. By the way, everybody knew this date. It was not a secret. The Russians knew it. The Americans knew it. The people that were left would be marched into ditches, buried alive. The few that got shot would be a small mercy. As time got closer, the hope of survival of the entire city was diminishing. This is sometimes called the siege of Leningrad. Hitler's army was unstoppable. He printed invitations for this evening, 81 years ago, to have a celebratory celebration in the Astoria Hotel. Invitations were printed. But the conductor of the Leningrad Symphony Orchestra and related ministries proposed to Stalin that on the final evening of it being a Russian city, they would have a final concert, the termination of the siege, farewell. Stalin agreed, and they set up loudspeakers and microphones so that everyone could hear in Moscow, in Leningrad, all around the countryside, huge speakers for this last concert. In a pitifully weak defiance of Nazi Germany, they could only find 30 musicians that were strong enough from starvation to even lift their instruments. They went to the front lines, got anyone that could play an instrument, brought it in for rehearsals. One horn, horn, horn player, as reported, went to lift his instrument to play and couldn't end up putting it down. No, the melody starts out, first of all, after a few minutes, the orchestra of this symphony goes to silence. Very unusual. And then a tiny, tiny melody so innocent, so soft, banal, it starts out with a snare drum, very softly playing, and then the violin plucking out the most banal, childlike, vulnerable melody. similar to one of Hitler's favorite songs from The Merry Widow. This is a 110-piece orchestra. And then it gathers a little bit of speed This goes on for about eight minutes. I'm not going to play eight minutes, right? Eight minutes of drawing a single, vulnerable, childlike melody, so vulnerable sounding, it's unheard of in symphonic composition. After about eight minutes, the whole orchestra is in full force. Everything is thrown in by the kitchen sink. It's bold. It's ugly. It's grotesque. It's full of hatred. It's crushing a menace, if it can. It is grotesque. Now, don't forget, the audience, as you saw in that picture, 
a thousand people there, on the verge of dying, knowing that when this is over, the Nazis are going to march in and they're dead. They're sitting there waiting to die. And then, after an hour, the finale, the last couple of moments. by their neighbors. This is all well documented. Those that didn't have the strength to take a deep breath are now standing in a feeling of a sense of victory. The Nazis listened. They listened. When it was over, there was silence. A little girl walks up the main, the main aisle with a bouquet of fresh flowers. Don't forget, the Nazis didn't allow anything to be grown if you grew a garden, your house was warmed. And yet, she comes with a bouquet of fresh flowers to give the conductor. People are weeping. The Nazis were listening in their trenches to this concert. Years later, a German soldier told the conductor, it had a slow but powerful effect on us, I quote. The realization began to dawn that we would never take Leningrad, but something else started to happen. We began to see that there was something stronger than starvation, fear, and death, the will to stay human, unquote. August 9th ended with no final invasion. Hitler's celebration at the Astoria Hotel never happened. Hitler did not make it to the Astoria Hotel for a celebration banquet. The music was the Leningrad premiere of Dmitry Shostakovich's Symphony No. 7, later named the Leningrad. He takes a monotonous, banal march in the style of the most banal music hall tune and relentlessly and ingeniously turns it into a grotesque parody that implicitly and with enormous force stigmatizes the non-entity of German Nazism. Secretly, Shostakovich thought of that against Stalin himself. Stalin is ruining Leningrad and Hitler is just finishing it off, is what he said. Shostakovich's symphonies are language. In no small part describing Soviet Russia in World War II. We may be empathetic to that message but we didn't live it. Stalin knew his debt to Shostakovich, a dangerous position for him. The idol of Russia, more than Stalin. Nobody had an easy relationship with Stalin, but Shostakovich's popularity was a constant duel. Stalin's favorite music was simple, accessible to the most people, and nationalistic in spirit. But most importantly, it had to be Russian. Time magazine made Shostakovich the man of the year right after that, in a fireman's hat. On the cover, that text there says, amid the bombs bursting in Leningrad, he heard the chords of victory. Russia's second city, saved by a classical symphony, 
Where does that place Shostakovich? The symphonies are a biography, a narrative of the horrors and uncertainty of life in Soviet Russia under the ruthless grip of Stalin. Because he was so, vul he was so visible as a symbol of Soviet Russia, he was particularly vulnerable. Could Shostakovich be a cultural leader at the expense of power-obsessed Stalin? In order to get financial security, whereas some of his music was prohibited, some of his performances were stopped, he also wrote music for a different audience, movies. This is a dance of the dolls from a ballet that he wrote. And you've got to see, he also had a sense of humor. The Nose. I know. Popular comic opera. It was Monty Python like Benny Hill, Charlie Chaplin, Saturday Night Live, but amazingly genius operatic music. The flavor, very Russian. It fit what Stalin wanted. Stalin was amused at first but then felt Shostakovich had degraded Russia and he banned it. And with that, he placed Shostakovich in a cloud of uncertainty. Would Shostakovich himself be removed? Shostakovich felt threatened. It's unusually unique. Culturally Russian, a nobleman has a shave and a haircut from an amateur peasant barber and in the process, his nose is accidentally cut off. <laughs> happens. The barber saves the nose as a souvenir. The nobleman for the rest of the opera searches for his lost nose. <laughs> Here are two brief excerpts, the shave and then a dream ballet of the nose and other lost noses. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's marvelous, it's Russian theater. It made Stalin very aware of the influence of Shostakovich already becoming a symbol of Russia when he was 22 years old. <laughs>
nose enters. Enemy of the people was a catchphrase, meaning you're going to be executed. <laughs> One example of this was Shostakovich had a very close friend who was an actor. And the play that he was acting in was reported to the ministry that it had a Western influence. One night after the show, when the actor was finished filming, he walked backstage, was bludgeoned to death, and then dragged out to a street in Moscow, laid in the middle of the street, and cars drove over him as an example. Western influence? No. Shostakovich was terrified. That same year that Stalin made the declaration that Western influence, enemy of the people. Shostakovich releases a new ballet called The Golden Age, 1930. He was told to write a ballet that portrayed soccer players. The theme was a group of soccer players, tours with adventure, and by the way, the Russian Association of Proletarian Musicians condemned what they called light music. Gypsy music, jazz, two genres that Shostakovich adored. But as a survivor, Shostakovich put his name behind the campaign to purge the community of musicians guilty of disseminating it. Western culture was anti-Soviet, so he repeated in public. But on Broadway, I say year, there was a show called No No Nanette. It actually was dying. People were walking out after the first act. So the producer asked the composer, Vincent Humans, to write a hit song. Keep people in, we need a hit song. This song was a hit, and the piano version got smuggled into Russia on microfilm. Mm -hmm. Shostakovich saw it in a little coffee shop under a magnifying glass, and this is what he got. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Mind you, of Western influence was your key to execution.
can't get much western, more western than that. <laughs> All right, it is tea for two, as you have it guessed by now. This is a common garden production. Uh, by the way, the Russian text there says tea for two. This is cold language. This has nothing to do with the ballet. Nothing before it, nothing after it. It's tea for two, always in the middle. Review. And everything changed. The opera, The Lady Macbeth of the Sims District, I know it sounds a little off winning the name. He did get some criticism from his earlier works, but it was this piece first performed in 1934, that marked the beginning of his turbulent relationship with Stalin. This is well known. It was an unprecedented success. It secured Shostakovich's reputation as a composer of genius. Within a year, it had been formed in the US, in Argentina, all over the world. And two years after, and more than 200 performances, after the premiere in Leningrad, Stalin went to see it at the Bolshoi in Moscow. It so happens that the opera was so successful that there were three separate productions that same night in, in, in uh, Moscow. Alarm bells rang off when, when Stalin required Shostakovich to be in the theater that night with him. Stalin was in his bulletproof box with members of the Politburo. And at the end of the third act, there are four acts, he walks out. An article appeared in Pravda, and it was headlined, Muddle Instead of Music. He reviewed the opera, and Stalin wrote it, it's generally believed. It said that the music, and I quote, this bedlam of noise, quacks, grunts, growls, and suffocates itself in an orgy of depravity. And added that the composer, quote, ignored the demand of Soviet culture that all coarseness and savagery be abolished from every corner of Soviet life. This is pretty rich coming from Stalin. <laughs> and I quote, it's a, claim, it's a game of clever ingenuity that may end very badly. The opera was banned, and Shostakovich spent the next couple of years fearing arrest. His life was turned upside down. He was now an enemy of the people. I'm sure that Stalin really did hate the opera, but I can't help feeling that he so heavily condemned it in Pravda, a world newspaper, simply because Stalin felt Shostakovich 
needed to be brought down a peg or two. Shostakovich, Stalin, not good. From that moment on, Shostakovich had a gun to his head and was watched in everything he did. Shostakovich didn't leave the house without a toothbrush or a bar of soap in his pocket, keeping in mind this was eight years before he was the main factor in saving Leningrad. It was now Shostakovich versus Stalin. He was either with Stalin or against him, life or death. And Stalin took death very lightly. Was Shostakovich a threat to Stalin's influence? A genius of creativity versus a master of death. He lived figuratively with a gun to his head from then on. Everything he produced, performed, who he associated with, was evaluated. Two years after this, Shostakovich writes a new symphony, keeping in mind that his symphonies are a biography he was threatened that if the symphony was produced, he would be formally the enemy of the people kind of thing. They didn't perform it. The excuse given was that Shostakovich was dissatisfied. Again, this statement was a means of survival. The performers and the conductors <coughs> and the composer were threatened if the premier went forward. A friend of his, Galina Nishnishnishkia, during rehearsal, quote, said, a few dozen nincompoops gathered together to judge a genius. This is the opening of a major symphony. It starts out with a shriek. It screams. It's a cry for help. It was finally premiered 25 years later in 1961. And a friend did comment that his life would have been a lot different if it wasn't for that Pravda article. In the meantime, Shostakovich wrote. He had appointments, concerts. He played for silent movies. He wrote popular movies popular music and movie music to keep an income. Few in Russia could do this. He wrote the score for a piece called The Gadfly. Um, I've looked at the plot of it. I have to say I don't understand it. But uh, it was a romantic movie.
just to give you an example of what Shostakovich knew. He had access to foreign newspapers, of course, and many didn't. The storming of Berlin in March, April of 1945, this is towards the end of World War II, Marshal Zhukov, in order to save tanks, sent infantry soldiers to attack minefields, thus stepping on mines and blowing themselves up. The soldiers cleared the minefields with their bodies, creating a corridor for troops, therefore bringing the great victory closer. Survivors, an embarrassment to Stalin, in the streets of Leningrad and Moscow, it was unheroic of here. In 1950, over one night, the authorities conducted a roundup and gathered armless, legless, homeless, disabled people, like bags of trash, over 100,000, centrally transported, loaded them to the station, and loaded them into wagons to the camps. Blind minstrels were required to gather, to gather. They were also dropped in Siberia. They were of no use to Soviet Russia. And Shostakovich knew this was going on. Not everybody, not many knew, but he knew. World War II victory. Stalin commanded Shostakovich for a victory symphony. It would be Shostakovich's ninth. I'm not familiar with Beethoven's ninth. Beethoven's ninth is monumentally grand. It is the keynote of all grand symphonies. In fact, the CD, 12 centimeters, was made to hold 74 minutes for Beethoven's ninth. This is what Stalin got. circus music. Circus music with flutes and piccolos that was only 25 minutes long. Shostakovich, this was like a suicide pact. He expected to be eliminated. He embarrassed Stalin with his victory symphony. This was a suicidal statement. But despite the radical modernism of some of his early works, the failure of the nose, Shostakovich was much less vulnerable than most of his colleagues during the Cultural Revolution. He could still compose, perform, teach, and play the piano. He managed to walk a fine line. And he continued for the time being at least, to compose the music he wanted. He needed to live, compose, and survive in an increasingly hostile artistic environment, however underscored as a hypocrite. This is the number of Russian people that died under the hands of the Soviet Union. Not military, just civilians and it's severely undercounted. There was constant, constant fear. And this is what Shostakovich, so close to the source of it, lived by. In 1953, Stalin died. How he died is another story. Shostakovich was 47 years old, and Nikita Khrushchev stepped in. Shostakovich was now seen as a hero and was forced to join the Communist Party even though he hated it. It was to protect his family. And then something very curious emerged. In his 10th symphony and other works, four notes appear now and then, D, E flat, C, B, and in the German designation of these notes, it's D, S, C, H. 
Dmitry Shostakovich. Da da da. Unusual, odd sequence of note, but it says, I'm still here. Now, there are a few photographs, hardly any, where Shostakovich is not smoking. Russian cigarettes, unfiltered, phony filtered with pieces of cardboard, fashion statement. It was in this country at the same time. It was deemed to be fashionable, healthful, good tasting, but exactly 33 years to the hour of his night Saint Leningrad, Shostakovich died. August 9th. August 9th of lung cancer. This tortured creative genius with Stalin's gun to his head is no more. Although few could speak the language of music, most understood what he was saying. His symphonies spoke, I know what you're suffering, me too. Let me end with a waltz from a movie, The First Echelon, another romantic movie. This was in the first soundtrack. It's been in many other movies. You might recognize it, you might not.